Hi there, welcome to uh, Naturally Speaking. I'm your host tonight, Larry Evans, and our, the subject of our, of our little show is the oyster mushroom and oyster mushroom cultivation here in Montana. Um, we have a nice uh, picture here of the oyster mushroom, uh, Pleurotus austriatus, and we'll be giving a workshop this uh, Saturday about the, about the cultivation of this mushroom. A uh, few of the people who are with me today on the panel, uh, Bradley from the Alliance for the Wild Rockies, Hello. and uh, Ginny McCammett from the State uh, Horticulturalist uh, here. She's actually with the MSU Extension Office. And uh, Radley. Hi, um, I'm Radley Watkins, and I'm working with the Alliance for the Wild Rockies. The Alliance is a group working to protect biodiversity in the Northern Rockies. And um, a program like this of raising mushrooms, I feel, is a great way to work within the natural ecosystem um, using native species and protect our bioregion and um, protect our water quality and our riparian zone. Seems great. to be a really great program. Well, hopefully we'll have some good success in uh, getting landowners interested in uh, raising oyster mushrooms for Thank this you. type of program. Uh, Ginny, have you got something? This is Ginny McCammett with the, uh, the State Horticulturalist here in Missoula. And um, I mainly work with growers of all kinds of crops in Missoula County. Some of them are like apples and strawberries and trees and shrubs and grass and, and also alternative crops such as mint and mushrooms is one of them. Huckleberries is another important alternative crop and ginseng even and kabocha squash. It's a whole range. So it's, it's quite an interesting job. I get to learn a lot every day. Neat. Neat. Well, tonight's program is mostly about mushroom cultivation and not just mushroom cultivation, but primarily the cultivation of oyster mushrooms. We have a few slides here to show you, uh, for example, about different mushrooms that are commonly cultivated for commercial purposes. Uh, the first picture that we'll be having in just a second here is of the shiitake mushroom, all right? The shiitake mushroom grows uh, in Japan, where it's a very important commercial species. And uh, here's a nice picture of the shiitake. This, is grow this grows on oak logs, and many farmers in other regions of the country uh, tend to cultivate this mushroom. Uh, unfortunately, here in Montana, it's a little, it's a little bit cold and uh, dry for shiitake cultivation. Some people have uh, put up greenhouses, of course, uh, heated with wood stoves to try and make it more amenable. But again, in Montana, since the native substrate is oak, you've got to import the oak trees, you've got to import the, the heat, uh, it seems like there might be better places for that. Do oak trees grow native in Japan? Yes, they do. Well, that's in, been interesting. Yeah, in fact, uh, the shiitake, shia, is how they say the word oak. Shia uh -huh. take, and take, of course, is mushroom, so the mushroom that grows on oak. Huh. It's, a, it's a neat little uh, insight there. Um, and another mushroom that uh, is commonly cultivated is this one, uh, the reishi, or Ganoderma lucidum. Now, this mushroom uh, is very important medicinally and um, is sells for about $50 a pound uh, in Oriental markets. It's uh, touted as a cancer cure and uh, immune stimulant, and it's uh, there's a large and growing market for this mushroom right now. What, what country is this grown in? This is grown in Japan and also in uh, the United States down south. Uh, mm -hmm. Some growers in Texas are growing this now. Do uh, they export this mushroom? Yes, they do, and also, if you're keen on it, you can go down to the uh, health food stores and pick up tablets made of, of the reishi mushroom. How would a mushroom like that fare in Montana? Well, it's, uh, 
We have related species that grow up here, uh, and they grow on like uh, hemlock and uh, other trees. But in generally, this one, uh, this mushroom, the uh, Ganoderma lucidum, the, the brachy mushroom, is more of a warm weather mm -hmm. uh, climate. It would have trouble with our winters and extra dry summers. Larry, the director said uh, we're free to ask questions too. Uh, going back to that uh, picture of the shiitake, uh, where it was those long, you know, pieces there. Thank. One more, maybe. There we go. Well, could, so these are those growing there? Mm-hmm. Or actually, you can see the uh, some of the little guys coming right off the. The stump over here. If you mm -hmm. can get, uh, if you can zoom in on that or something. That's mm -hmm. uh, the the mushrooms do grow there. And uh, to to so this is like a greenhouse. This is a greenhouse. And to cultivate shiitake, you raise and lower the temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, shiitake need to be dunked in water and held at about 40 degrees Fahrenheit to stimulate their fruiting. And uh, that's all well and good, but in Montana, we have trouble in the wintertime anyway getting the temperature up to 40 degrees <laughs> Fahrenheit. So uh, it, it might be a little difficult. Uh, there, there are a lot of problems associated with it in our area. Um, but anyway, um, the main mushroom of our, of our interest in this program, again, is the oyster mushroom. This mushroom doesn't mind our Montana winters. It grows on the cottonwood trees, which are quite common around the river banks, uh, all along the Bitterroot, Clark Fork, and by golly. I think the cottonwoods are the, among the only native trees that grow naturally in this area that are that are deciduous. Mm -hmm. It's one of the few. It's true. Well, the one of the few that get really big anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. they do. They, uh, the, we found the cottonwoods, uh, geez, throughout the state, even in the eastern part of the state. Uh, we've got quite a large uh, population of cottonwoods, and they do pretty much grow exclusively along our riparian areas, next to uh, rivers and whatnot. Uh, here's a shot of the leaf of the cottonwood tree for people who may not be too familiar with it. Um, it's, a very, it's one of our more common species, and uh, here in Missoula you can find it along the irrigation ditches, uh, Right out on Third Street. I mean, you can mm -hmm. find it along the river in R Riverfront Park, or oh, anywhere along the Clark Fork River. You can find it in Greeno Park, growing there naturally. A lot of them in Greeno Park. There's quite yeah. a bit of variation in the leaf shape. It's so beautiful this time of year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, at any rate, the these cottonwood stands, uh, and especially the the dead cottonwood trees are the perfect habitat for the oyster mushroom. The uh, oyster mushroom is uh, not a parasite on trees. It grows on uh, dead cottonwood trees. And um, it can, uh, we, we, we find this pretty commonly uh, in occurring naturally in cottonwood stands here in the state. The idea of our program uh, of, uh, of the workshop this weekend will be to show people how to encourage the growth of this uh, oyster mushroom. And, you know, it, it's a, since it's a naturally occurring mushroom, kind of encourage the mushroom to grow in the parts of the state where it's already uh, commonly found. Uh, here's a nice example of the, uh, of the perfect environment for a, an oyster mushroom. It's a cottonwood tree that's just met with a, uh, a little tragedy. And uh, as we can see with this close-up, the bark is still fresh, and uh, the tree is just recently dead. Um, at this point, the cottonwood is susceptible to a large number of different uh, species of mushrooms, which will attack the uh, dead wood. Um, and in order to encourage the, the oyster mushroom, we tend to pop off a little bit of the bark with a hatchet or axe or even a knife in some cases. And then in this area where you see the, uh, 
where you see the where you see the uh, split in the log, we'll we'll hop in and insert a little bit of mushroom. Is it are are mushrooms sort of like vultures in that they prefer a fresh kill? Okay. Yeah, they do. Um, partly because the the recent the recently dead mushroom will uh, the recently dead tree still has a lot of water, mm -hmm. still has plenty of uh, fresh dissolved sugars in the cambium layer and things like this. Um, whereas something that's set for a while, dried out, uh, is only the, the tougher mushrooms, the dedalias and some of the ornery polypores will kind of attack just about anything that's got cellulose. But um, for both uh, the oyster mushroom and uh, the lion's head, which we'll look at later, uh, it's a very good bet to well, use fresh wood. Um, what's the likelihood of having the oyster mushroom move into your prime conditions rather than a different species of mushroom? Uh, you mean just by accident? Uh, when, after you make your incision in the log, are you likely to have a variety of species move in? Or is it... Sure. Uh, it, when, you're, when you inoculate by a crude technique like this hatchet job uh, here, you can't really expect uh, uh, pure culture to result. Um, I've found dependable results between 10 and 25 percent mm -hmm. of the inoculations that I do just with dead oyster mushrooms uh, jammed in the bark of a tree. About, yeah, uh, between 10 percent and one quarter of all the ones that I inoculate um, survive or produce fruit. And that's not bad, considering you can do uh, ten, in a, 10 in a minute. Sure. Do you get um, other mushrooms growing in the places where you inoculated with the oyster mushroom? Very rarely. If the oyster mushroom doesn't take, uh, usually nothing's going to take. The oyster mushroom is a pretty good bet for two reasons. One, um, it's a pretty aggressive mushroom. I mean, it, it will grow in conditions that other mushrooms shy away from. For example, Montana. Okay. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, when you've got when you've got an open wound like this, you are probably making your your tree more susceptible to other other infections. Um, your dead tree. Your dead tree. Yes. And um, well, let me let's take a one more look at the uh, slides here. We've got the. Uh, excuse yeah. me, I've asked you in times gone by, and I'm sorry if this question is out of order here, but what are the chances of, of uh, any kind of a, you know, cultivated mushroom industry in Montana, it, you know, employing people and where it would make, you know? Well, I'd like to, I'd like to say that that's a possibility. It's something I would sure like to see happen. Um, Could it happen? The, the limiting factor, of course, is going to be uh, markets for mushrooms. Um, I think uh, as a culture, we Americans tend to be kind of mycophobic, okay? We're a little bit afraid of uh, anything fungal. And um, as a result, I mean, you know, we've grown up as kids being told don't eat that, that's a mushroom and it's poisonous. Um, so we do have a bit of a a task, as it were, to try and uh, uh, educate or inform people about the number, the large number of, of delicious edible species that we do have growing naturally and that can be cultivated here in the state. Well, Larry, am I wrong in thinking that um, here in Missoula I've probably seen the oyster mushroom for sale at our farmer's market? Yes, um, yeah, we, that's been for sale at the farmer's market uh, for about three years now. Right. Uh, various various groups have been uh, bringing that into market and uh, selling it there. It's probably one of the most dependable mushrooms in terms of identification. There's really nothing else that looks uh, quite like an oyster mushroom, and uh, there's you know it's a large it's a large uh, white fleshy mushroom, and it does have the the prominent gills underneath. It has a nice fishy, almost floral type of aroma, ah. and it, it dries well, so it's, yeah. How, is, how do people cook with it? Well, oyster mushroom, uh, 
it was quite it was quite good in a number of ways. Uh, I like to cut it into strips and uh, dip it in egg batter, roll it in flour yes. and pepper, yes. and throw it on the fire. And uh, you know, there you go. You've got some nice fried breaded mushrooms. Um, a lot of people chop it up and put it in soup. It does have that fish-like quality, and uh, when it gets cooked in a soup, it uh, does very well. So, um, so next, no? Uh, well, let's see where are we here. Okay, the um, one of the reasons that we have. Uh, done this program and uh, the reason that the, Depart uh, the State Department of Natural Resources and Conservation has uh, extended a grant to cover these workshops is because one of the worst, one of the main uh, problems in the countryside with water pollution is uh, animal, animal infer interference on uh, the stream. Uh, in other words, cattle walking uh, into the river, defecating in the river, um, and, you know, contaminating the water supply in, in various different ways. Um, the, the state is now uh, trying to work with uh, agriculturalists to uh, encourage them to exclude cattle from uh, sensitive riparian areas. And of course, this is a, a task which takes some money. Um, what what happens when the cattle and the mushrooms share the riparian area together? Well, the cattle don't mind, <laughs> uh, but the mushroom doesn't exactly benefit. Um, when you have the cattle and mushrooms uh, in areas, in my experience, I've been uh, I've been. I guess you'd say nature crafting these wild mushrooms for about four years now. Mm -hmm. um, and when the cattle are in the same enclosure as the oyster mushroom, they tend to walk on, eat, defecate on the mushrooms, and generally render them uh, undesirable, <laughs> at least. Um, Just as almost they do to any other ve natural vegetation in the riparian area. Well, it's. Uh, you know, I think uh, cattle, like anything else, are, are a resource that wants to be managed in a, in a you know, in a useful way. Um, you can see on this, uh, the next slide here, just an example of, of why we uh, are hoping to be able to exclude uh, cattle from the immediate area of, of mushroom production, is that um, on this, on the uh, left side is the state land where uh, the cottonwood stand is, and on the right side of the picture is, is private land where the cattle are run. Mm -hmm. um, and the left side, uh, you know, in this case definitely does provide a more uh, desirable environment for cultivating mushrooms. Um, it's, you know, again, uh, there's a lot of other factors, but uh, the, the desirability of erecting a fence near the, the water uh, supply and the fact that the mushrooms benefit from the exclusion of cattle kind of works together in this program. Sure. Um, so we're hoping that uh, this will, you know, the effect of this will be positive overall. And there it is again. There's the oyster mushroom. Um, feel free to give us a call here at uh, 542 MCAT. We've got, uh, we're talking about oyster mushrooms and the possibilities for cultivating them here in uh, western Montana, and we'd like to hear your opinions or your objections. <laughs> so. so is just about anybody's land that has cottonwoods um, ready to go with the oyster mushroom? Yeah, with a, with a really short bit of information, uh, it would be pretty easy to start growing uh, oyster mushrooms or maybe start harvesting oyster mushrooms that you already have on there. Sure. Uh, this weekend, uh, I'll be giving a workshop uh, sponsored by the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation and free to anyone who's interested to attend um, down at the Teller Wildlife Refuge. That's, that'll be, uh, we'll have uh, programs at 10, 12 and 2 o'clock uh, during the day. It's a short program, 
doesn't last more than an hour, and we can take you out in the woods and show you how to inoculate with oyster mushrooms and give you a supply of enough mushrooms to get started on your own. So, when, when, how does the life cycle of the oyster mushroom grow? When does it? When does a spore inoculation happen in nature? And then what happens over the winter? And then. When does the mushroom start growing, and how does that all work? Good, good question. Um, the oyster mushroom generally fruits in the fall. Uh, we also get uh, secondary uh, fruiting, as we say, in the spring. What, what does fruiting mean? Fruiting is when the mushroom erupts, or the mushroom produces a fruiting body, or Spores. makes our visible mushroom. And uh, you can see uh, from these mushrooms uh, on the underneath part where the gills are, they emit a uh, dust-like spores. Now these spores are windborne. They land on, a, on an injury on a tree or more likely on a freshly broken or dead tree. And the spores germinate and begin to grow through the, through the medium, through the, through the wood in this case. What time of year does this happen? This is happening right now. Oh, As we is. speak, they're out there <laughs> sporulating and germinating and, and crawling through the wood. Ooh, just gives you the shivers, huh? <laughs> I tell you. Um, but, uh, but this also happens in the spring. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, many small insects, such as box elder beetles, make their home in the oyster mushroom, get covered with spores, and go fly off in another place. And as beetles and other insects tend to do in the wintertime, they head towards the base of a tree or head underneath a log for, to find the warmest, uh, driest place they can, carrying the spores of the oyster mushroom with them. And at this point, when they freeze or whatever, then the oyster mushroom can germinate on the insect's body or in the tree mm -hmm. where the insect is sought shelter and uh, is spread in that way too. Do they, do they flower in the spring or fall, just the fall? Both the spring and the fall. Um, it seems to be kind of dependent on things like uh, moisture and, you know, availability of water. If we have a dry spring, we see virtually none. If we have a wet spring, we may have oyster mushrooms for a week or three weeks, depends. Mm -hmm. um, in the spring, they're a little bit less desirable as a, as a food because the insects seem to get to them a lot faster. Uh -huh. Temperatures are generally warmer. And to tell you the, the honest truth, this fall hasn't been a very good year for our pal the oyster because it, uh, the temperatures dropped quickly and as soon as the, the rains that we had all summer, where'd they go, huh, huh, uh -huh. you know? Um, the rains avoided us and we've had sunny days and very cold nights and that's not much of a combination for uh, mushroom growth. We need more moisture. Last year was a great year. It got cold, but it was plenty wet, and we hauled in the oysters in bunches. So. Couple questions. <coughs> you yeah. said uh, it, uh, inject, did you say inject uh, the spores? You would show, at the workshop, you would show people how to... Introduce. Okay. I, I, maybe I said inject. In? Yeah. To yeah. I, I, I think that hatchet is a little crude to be called an injection, but it's, I probably did use that word. But I mean, is it like is it like sending away for bees? You can send away for these cultures, mushroom cultures, and get them. Hey, here in Montana, you shouldn't have to look far. Um, just about, I there's there's at least two dozen sites right here inside the Missoula city limits where mushroom oyster mushrooms are. are fruiting right now. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, with a little bit of uh, practice, uh, take a look at your field guide and feel free to call in uh, about, you know, for help with identification. It's a very easy mushroom to identify. Um, if you do have questions about it, of course, uh, we'll be at the farmer's market usually to do mushroom IDs. Things like that. When's the best time to pick it for taste? Is it before they, they start sporulating or after? I would say the best time to pick them is before all the bugs get in them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, yeah, that, that's usually, I'd say we're, we're nearing the end of the optimum time. The, the last two weeks have been prime. 
for uh, getting for getting mushrooms, and the uh, you know the next week or so it will still be possible. How does a person tell when the mus oyster mushroom is spoiling? How can you tell? Uh, you can pick up one of the leaves underneath here. Okay, you can lift up underneath the uh, underneath the the actual mushroom itself and see a white spore deposit underneath okay you can kind of see it here in the picture but again through the uh, miracle of uh, both television and uh, my nasty looking slides it's a little hard to see where the uh, where the spore where the spore print ends and the mushroom begins uh, but these mushrooms do have a distinct white spore print. It's like the mushrooms in the grocery store, they have dark brown spores. Right, the dark brown mushrooms. underneath. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are white underneath. They may get a little grayish as they get old. Okay. But uh, you'll, you'll definitely notice a white deposit, uh, almost like someone has spray painted underneath the mushroom, mm -hmm. maybe on the, on the leaves and, and duff on the forest oh. floor. Is it true that the mushrooms in the grocery store, you'll, you'll turn them upside down and you'll see this little ring of soft tissue when that, around the base of the stem, when that separates from the stem, does that mean it's less fresh? Well, it's a more mature mushroom. Yeah. It's further along. The mushrooms start as a button and then expand as they get older. But it, it's more an indication that the mushroom was older before it was picked rather than after. So for cooking quality, which should a person choose? Should they choose one with the cap intact or? Well, um, I don't know. I, 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 would, I would suggest, uh, you know, trying different species rather than just good old store-bought mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. there's, there's quite a few varieties now that, that are available. Mm -hmm. I what think, is, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to uh, say uh, that I think uh, that um, oh. working with Montana becoming so developed and all the people moving to our beautiful state here, um, it's, this is a great opportunity for us to start working within a natural system. And people have people that are already living in Montana make money off of our natural beauty rather than make money destroying our wild habitat. What's the, uh, what, for people, what is, what's the food value or health values of mushrooms? Like well, um, oyster mushrooms are one of the, one of the most studied of, uh, of our edible mushrooms. Uh, they are naturally high in fiber. They have a very low carbohydrate content, but they have about as much uh, protein as beans, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to grain or other other types of uh, I mean, the other quality sources. of the protein is similar to the quality of protein in beans. No, the uh, mushrooms supply all nine of the amino acids that we can't produce, uh -huh. and uh, in that respect, they're considered a complete uh, protein. Um, they and they have uh, by weight, by you know, by dry weight, uh, a comparable amount of. Uh, Protein to a to a bean. We got a collar here. Wait, wait, wait. I gotta do it out there. Oh. Okay. Hold on. Well, I pushed the button already, so I guess. We'll uh oh. Push Sorry. the button one again. Push the button. Okay. So I probably hung up on him, huh? Call in again. Call in again, there, callers. Uh, that was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But. Uh, We'd like to hear your question. We sure would like to hear your question because uh, I can't think of it myself. <laughs> <laughs> how much, mm -hmm. um, how many mushrooms, how many pounds of mushrooms can you expect to harvest off of a single downed cottonwood? Well, I've seen as many, as, as much as a hundred pounds off a single tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not unusual at all to find 15 or 20 pounds of oyster mushroom. Uh, on, on a single log. Just, just wait. Okay, we just have to wait here for a minute. Um, Suspense. We should talk about the, uh, the upcoming up events, events. At the Tawa. At the Tawa, yeah. Mm -hmm. after this Line one. Line one. Hello, you're on the air. 
Hi. Um, I was wondering if planting oyster mushrooms in your cottonwood grove uh, damages the trees or kills the live trees. Okay. Uh, thanks. Actually, uh, I just heard. I just uh, corresponded with Don Mathry, uh, the MSU uh, plant pathologist, and he's assured me that there's no danger to living cottonwood trees from uh, oyster mushrooms or oyster mushroom cultivation because they grow exclusively, to his knowledge, on dead uh, cottonwood trees. Living trees have many mechanisms for repelling pests that we are not aware of, and one of the things that is indicative of this is, we, we, I don't know if you heard about the recent study where they compared wood, wooden cutting boards with plastic ones, mm. and wooden cutting boards were much more sanitary because they have some kind of antibacterial mechanism that plastic doesn't have. Mm. And I think the same would extend to a living tree. Sure. Yeah. They got an antibiotics or antibodies mm -hmm. circulating to take out invaders. Makes sense. Sure. And are you still there, caller? Yeah. Do you um, I was also wondering, I had um, <coughs> some Parisium, the lion hands, uh -huh. um, in some cottonwoods. But there's also oysters around, and I was wondering how they compete with the oyster mushroom. Okay, we have a picture of the Harissium mushroom on the screen now. Um, the Harissium mushroom is another very desirable uh, species that we're hoping to introduce, uh, or I should say expand the role of, in uh, western Montana um, and in terms of as a desirable species I personally prefer the herisium. I think it's a very delicious mushroom but I'm afraid that it's a little trickier to cultivate. Have you had luck uh, cultivating it there, Caller? Um, a few little ones have popped out but you know nothing really big. Uh -huh. So you, you've inoculated with uh, herisium and you've You've been able to get successful results. Um, yeah, not not as not as big results as I was expecting, but uh, mm -hmm. something. But like I said, they got a lot of competition. I think I'm wondering if the, those oysters will move in. Well, the oyster mushroom is certainly more aggressive than the uh, herisium. Uh, it's uh, it, it grows quite a bit more quickly, and it uh, seems to be better adapted to the environment. Um, all I can say is. Uh, encourage your herisium as much as you can. Uh, it certainly is a marvelous mushroom. Okay. All right, thanks for calling. Bye-bye. So, Larry, do you actually plant these mushrooms into the downed trees, or do you release spores into the trees? Using the old uh, hatchet job technique that uh, I showed you there earlier, um, <laughs> I've uh, using this this hatchet technique. I have uh, inoculated uh, mushrooms quite successfully, and in fact, uh, these mushrooms here are an example of uh, of an inoculation. I see. Um, I started doing this back in early 1980s, and uh, then again when I came back to Missoula uh, in about 1990, and I've been inoculating with great success. Do you inoculate with spores or actual mushrooms? The easiest way and the fastest way that I've found is just to take uh, actual mushroom fruiting bodies and plant them right in between the bark and the wood layer. Um, other people have uh, used techniques like uh, taking a maul or a wedge and splitting the, the tree open, stuffing the, the uh, mushroom inside and then popping the maul out and the tree closes right back up on it. Hmm. Um, this is great. Also, I tend to use uh, oyster mushrooms that are infected with uh, bugs that have infestations of various insects. And of course, these little guys, at this point, they become my friends and help uh, disperse the, the spores sure. around the log. How long does it take from the time you put the spores into the tree to the time you get to pick a mushroom? The fastest that has ever happened for me, personally, was uh, I planted some in the fall of 1991 and harvested in the spring of 1992. So it takes so, at least a year. Sometimes well, a little fall to spring. So this okay. was really just over winter. Um, the more, I mean, I get real dependable results within a year. Huh. 
So do you usually like put the spores on the top of the log or on the sides or underneath? Again, I try to make sure that the uh, the mushroom is inside. You know, I, I will take take it to the point of uh, getting that right inside and ram it underneath the, the bark the, and then if, folding it back down. Yeah, but is that on the side of the log or on the top? Or I oh, I see what you mean. Um, to tell you the truth, uh, I've tried it all around the log and it seems like inoculating from the end works pretty well. Huh. Um, inoculating along the side seems to work. I haven't really noticed any difference between the side, the top, the bottom. Okay. Do you prefer a sunny side or a shady side of the? Um, again, usually when you're looking at our, any of our riparian areas here, you're looking at a place that's in mixed sun and shade. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, you know, again, uh, that seems to be the environment that it's found in naturally. So why mess with Mother Nature? I mess with my <laughs> <nature>. <laughs> and it works. There you go. Um, so, should we mention? Um, yeah, this this weekend uh, when we have the uh, the mushroom cultivation seminar, they'll down at the Teller Wildlife Refuge. The Alliance for the Wild Rockies will also be having uh, a series of workshops. Uh, uh, we are going to be having our eighth annual Wild Alliance for the Wild Rockies rendezvous. Um, down at the Teller Wildlife Refuge. And this rendezvous will start at about six o'clock on Friday afternoon and um, go through the whole weekend. And um, some of our more um, interesting events that we'll be having, we'll be having the very famous David Brower giving um, our opening ceremonies. Um, Neat. Yes. Who's, who's David Brower? David Brower is, um, one of the most famous environmentalists alive today. He Sierra founded Club. the Earth. He founded um, Earth Island Institute and was a big <coughs> part of the Sierra Club for a long time. And we're very excited to hear him speak. And um, he just, he's very, um, very powerful speaker. And we're, all, we're really excited to have Neat. him. Some of the other um, lectures that we'll be giving during the weekend, um, We'll be talking about preserving the biodiversity in the Wild Rockies, and that's on Friday at 6.30. Um, campaign for the Wild Rockies, where our director, Mike Bader, will be speaking. Um, on Saturday, we're talking about the wild humans, the new conservation movement, um, the plague of the salmon and the bull trout hab habitat for large mammals in the Wild Rockies, um, the development of impact on grizzly bears, um, the timber harvesting effects on water quality and um, the eco economic values of the Wild Rockies. Mm -hmm. um, those are all things going on on Saturday, wolf recovery in the Wild Rockies. And we'll go through um, on Sunday till about noon. And it should be a really, really great weekend. Um, there's camping on the Teller Wildlife Refuge for $5 a night. There are rooms available too. There can be meals and um, it should be a great time. We'll be able mm -hmm. In between lectures, go check out the mushroom talk and sure. see how to or raise them. mushrooms. You bet. Should be a good you time bet. on the Teller Wildlife Thanks. Refuge. I don't know if we have a caller or not. Uh, we seem to have a light flashing on the phone. I'll give it a try. Doesn't look good to me. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's get back here to uh, to some of the. Uh, reasons. Here we go. Um, one other mushroom that uh, we'll be discussing this weekend is the, uh, the Herisium, Coralloides. Uh, this is not, the Germans call this mushroom Der Schwan, uh, the swan. Okay. And um, this mushroom can be cultivated on uh, poplar just as easily as the cottonwoods. Just as easily as the oyster mushroom. One. Okay, we do have a caller now on line one. Uh, maybe not. How about line two? Uh, how about not line two? No call again. Okay. There they are. Try it. Okay, I think I'll try it this time. Hello, you're on the air. Yeah, I, I just want to congratulate you guys. <laughs> Thanks. 
Uh, that was nice. Uh, someone <laughs> called to congratulate us. I don't quite understand, but uh, yeah. Larry, what's the, excuse me. What's yeah. the dimensions of what we're What's the dimensions of what we're looking at on this slide? This mushroom here is uh, about the size of a good-sized basketball or beach ball. Um, these, they're called the lion's head. Uh, Herisium corolloides. Wait, 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 uh, wait. Because of its size and because it does look kind of like a, a mane. You notice the little projectile sticking out with the tiny mm -hmm. teeth hanging down. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, this mushroom has the flavor of shrimp and it's uh, very good. In fact, I like to make a mock shrimp cocktail out of this uh, and dip them in cocktail sauce. The other possibility is uh, line one. Yes, uh, frying them up with walnuts. They're great. We got a caller here on line one. So, hello, you're on the air. Uh, hello, Larry. I have got a question about chanterelles. Can you cultivate those here in Montana? Uh, well, as far as I know, nobody has successfully cultivated chanterelles anywhere. Um, chanterelles like uh, many other uh, mycorrhizal mushrooms grow in relationship with the tree roots and they're dependent on a living tree to uh, to produce uh, their fruiting bodies. Uh -huh. And uh, I was at a talk you gave about truffles about a year ago. Uh, have you done anything more with those this year? We've uh, we have found, had a real exciting season for truffles this year. We had um, about 12 or 14 uh, new species or, or unreported species, previously unreported species, turn up here in uh, Montana. Um, we have, uh, I'm, I'm still awaiting identification of a couple of them because we need, uh, you know, microscopic analysis and whatnot. But uh, it looks like we now have uh, Tuber californicum, uh, the California truffle here in uh, Montana, as well as the, uh, the berry truffle, and also uh, something with the rather unappealing name of, of the, the grisly truffle. <laughs> okay, I was lucky enough to find some at a very high altitude here in Montana, mm -hmm. right up at the top of a pass. And I have got some pictures I'll bring by at the farmer's park on one of these days, that those would help. That would be great. I'm always eager to see what new stuff is turning up. And um, yeah, if, if uh, I think that truffles especially, because we in the past we've known so little about them here in Montana, it's a real exciting, uh, a real exciting subject. I'm sure you're aware, uh, caller, that the, that the, uh, the economic value of truffles is tremendous, and if uh, that we are able to develop a, a reasonable supply of truffles in Montana, that could really change the way that we look at our, especially our old growth stands mm -hmm. of uh, timber. We've got another caller. Is that it for you? Ca thank call? you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Um, what do I do? Hello, you're on the air. Yeah, I was wondering if there's uh, some kind of a picture book or whatever available so you know which kind of mushrooms are safe for you and which ones you want to stay away from. Sure, there's uh, probably just about as many books on mushrooms as there are uh, uh, mushrooms. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've got um, some, there's several good ones. Uh, Simon & Schuster has a nice, easy to use picture book. Um, the Audubon Society has put out a more comprehensive guide, which some people find a little confusing. <coughs> and uh, of course, uh, David Aurora's uh, The Bible of uh, the Mushrooms, The Mushrooms Demystified, is, is uh, not exactly a pocket guide, but uh, certainly comprehensive. Now, what's the, what's the most dangerous? I mean, what could they do to you? The bad kind? The bad kinds of mushrooms? I mean, do you just hallucinate, or could they kill you? Oh, well, the bad, uh, n none of the mushrooms we've been talking about tonight are going to give you any side effects at all. I just kind of um, caught the tail <laughs> just the last yeah. few minutes and it um, spurred my uh, curiosity. Sure. We've been mostly talking about the uh, oyster mushroom and with a little bit about the uh, herisium, uh, the mushroom that's on the screen right now. Uh, and 
discussing the possibility of cultivating these in our in the cottonwood areas uh, along the riverbanks and whatnot. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for your help. No. Why, sure. Thanks for calling. Yeah. The wrong species of mushroom can kill somebody. It just takes a little bit. So you have Certainly. to be very careful about identification. If you're not sure, find someone who's trained in it and who knows. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, there are, we're certainly not without poisonous species here in Montana, but uh, actually partly because of our uh, slightly more severe environment, shall we say, um, we are not uh, blessed with quite as many poisonous species as, say, California or the eastern seaboard. Um, still, uh, eating mushrooms randomly is just about as foolish as eating plants randomly. And I see very few people out, uh, you know, sampling the the forbs uh, that grow by the side of the road. So I would hope that people are equally sensible and cautious when they go and pick mushrooms. You want to yeah. teach your little children not to eat the mushrooms until they get a little older. <laughs> Can yeah. I go back just for a second? I'm always interested in the economics of crops, and I know I've asked you about this not only tonight but before or in times gone by, and I, I can recall reading Department of Agricultural Statistics uh, and that mushrooms, in terms of the space, you know, that, that the value of a mushroom crop per acre is the highest value, you know, whether it's, it's higher than corn, it's higher than wheat, it's higher than beans, etc. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now I know That's you're true. speaking tonight uh, <coughs> more about, you know, domestic cultivation and, mm -hmm. and hunting and gathering in our natural environment. But everybody in the country, when they go in the A&P, you know, shops for that little thing of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And I know you've also said to me before when I've asked this question, well, the heating is a problem. You know, I mean, you have to keep these greenhouses heated. But maybe the uh, extension person also has, I mean, has, is there any... Re could we, is there a potential for us going commercial with mushrooms in Montana? There most certainly is, but as of now, it is illegal in the state of Montana to buy or sell mushrooms. This is a problem because it's going on and it's not regulated, and that poses a threat to our consumers. And what I would like to see happen is to have a system for inspecting mushrooms set up so that to protect the consumer and also. Um, it, will, it would gain credibility to the mushroom industry. The mushroom industry itself, like many other <coughs> industries, could support the inspection costs so that the government wouldn't be further taxed. Politically, it's a real tough, it's a real tough move. It's going to have to take a big groundswell to get this going. And another thing that people might consider is, like, the huckleberry industry is also an industry that depends on native habitat for harvesting. We haven't figured out how to grow huckleberries either on a large scale. And if we could join forces with cottage industries like that, they're totally unregulated also, then we could gain a great, great deal of credibility and charge even more for the product. But down the road, we could see an alternative way of using, of land use mm -hmm. that brings in more money than timber mm -hmm. harvesting or raising cattle yes. with these mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Is that? Well, mushroom, I think that uh, one, one point to look at, uh, when McCarthy brought up the point that uh, mushrooms are one of the most uh, cost-efficient types of agriculture, uh, they produce the most breaker, even in the limited range that we're talking about enhancing oyster mushroom productivity here, we're looking, based on current wholesale prices in San Francisco, okay, um, you could easily produce upwards of 500 pounds of oyster mushrooms on an acre. Mm -hmm. And that means over $500. Um, so the economic potential here is, is quite, you know, quite justified. It's realized by Oregon because they do have a system set up for regulating mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And so they could, uh, mushroom pickers from Oregon come over to Montana, reap right. the harvest, and sell it in Montana. The economics, the money leaves Montana. Exactly. Because they do have a, 
a, an effective regulatory system. Yeah. That's true. This the same has happened in uh, Washington, where uh, the where the much actually commercial harvest has uh, been proposed uh, to be outlawed completely, and also in the state of Michigan. I would say that of of the three or four states, uh, California being kind of a nightmare right now um, mm -hmm. of of regulation and cross regulation. Uh, Michigan's is probably the simplest, most straightforward, and uh, most defensible. Um, the state of Michigan recognizes uh, recognizes a person who is a uh, anyone who is being employed <coughs> as a mushroom identifier or mushroom uh, selector. Mm -hmm. um, has the option to apply to the state of Michigan for a permit to do this legally. Mm -hmm. At this point, the state, without having to screen the individual, without having to set up a series of tests or put inspectors on site to check every individual mushroom, all of which are financially ridiculous, um, they can regulate the industry simply by issuing a permit to the person who's doing the identifying. Should any problems with that person's identification arise, the state then has the option to pull that person's permit and deny them the right to trade in mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, it, it starts to sound like something as as uh, as basic as a as an elk permit, mm -hmm. as a, as a hunting permit, yes, or sure. uh, something like this that. Uh, the responsibility of identification is going to rest on the person who's selling mm -hmm. the mushroom as opposed to trying to enact some regulatory body with experts and certification procedures and, and other ideas. But they do have certification procedures and regulations like in the fruit industry. I know that mm -hmm. for a fact yes. because fruit is a big industry and there's a lot of bucks and they want to make sure that their product is going out. If it's labeled as a certain quality, they want to make sure. And mm -hmm. the farmers are the ones who are most insistent on this, even though sure. some of the farmers are Make not sure they're New Zealand others. apples. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. a very complex issue. Sure. Uh, well, I don't think anybody uh, is eager to invite regulation of any industry. But on the other hand, um, when you're looking at mushrooms, you're looking at uh, something that doesn't have any legitimacy right now in mm -hmm. the state of Montana. Mm -hmm. And because it's recognized in other states, people who are interested in doing business in Montana mushrooms mm -hmm. will take them to another state, mm -hmm. and Montana will forfeit that revenue. Mm -hmm. So it's, although it may or may not be in the interest of the people in the industry, it's certainly mm -hmm. in the interest of the people of Montana and probably the state of Montana to recognize that this industry is taking place. Mm -hmm. How quick do you think that sort of recognition could take place? How, how long would it take something like that to come about? It's well, kind of politics. <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, we, we all know how um, exceedingly fine the wheels of politics grind. Sure. They go very, very fast or very, very slow, and they but don't have much in between. They certainly so grind, uh, yes. Well, what would be the fight against against regulating mushrooms? There's a great fear. I've talked to some higher-ups, and I can understand <coughs> their concerns, and I must say I identify with some of them. Because if you get someone who says, oh, I can identify mushrooms, and it's just a charlatan, you can use charlatans in any industry. Sure. And there's, they want to say, okay, I'll sell these mushrooms for 500 bucks a pound or whatever. And they go and make a big profit real quick, and then they sell these poisonous mushrooms. That's a serious concern. So sure. they. And they don't have the ability or training anywhere in the government to be able to know who's honest, who's not, who's legit, who's not. And so they don't want to touch up the 10-foot pole. I see. That's where they're coming from, and I can understand it. They don't have any funds to do this either. And it looks like they're going to have fewer funds. <laughs> uh, we got a call. Is this We'll see in a minute. We'll see. Okay. Another thing, another regulation that is important that's been recently passed is that the USDA has a recent regulation. If you make, I think it's $15,000 worth selling any kind of commodity, be it mushrooms or kohlrabis or parsnips, you have to have a certificate with the USDA. Wait, wait, wait. 
No? Another false alarm. Ah, yeah. oh, the joys of telecommunications. <laughs> Line four? No, four minutes. Four minutes. Does, can we, are we, do we have a call? That's the other question. Just to pursue that old horse of mine a little bit farther, uh -huh. what, what about, what, but what about commercial mushroom greenhouses in Montana? Is that worth? I, I know that would depend exactly on the species. Um, a lot of people are uh, cultivating shiitake mushrooms um, on a commercial basis and, and doing it fairly well. Um, I would say that Montana is just probably not the ideal place to do it because of your uh, temperature extremes and the lack of moisture. You've got uh, a big heating well, well, greenhouse. Yeah. And it okay. seems like our natural environment is so perfect for it. Yeah. We do have a caller on line one. So. With two minutes to go. Hello, caller. Hi, I was just uh, wondering what uh, the mushrooms in a store are called. Yeah, the name of the mushrooms in the store, uh, Agaricus bisporus. Uh, Agaricus is the genus name, and bisporus is the species name. We also have uh, a variety called Portobello, which is also uh, Agaricus uh, bisporus, but it's a, it's a, I guess a good metaphor would be a hybrid. It, it's a it's a specially devised strain of, of agaricus. Sort of like a cultivated variety of strawberries. Well, this is a cultivated variety of mushrooms? Mm, yeah, mm -hmm. the portobellos. And they're usually allowed to ripen much further. They're bigger oh. mushrooms. Um, uh, which tastes the best in spaghetti sauce? Uh, they all taste good. <laughs> boy, my favorite is uh, the Boletus edulis. Well, I'd even I'd even go with some swillis in a in a spaghetti sauce. <laughs> so they're not everyday common words. They're just not mushrooms, and they have genuses, and there are hundreds and millions of types of mushrooms. So. We got about we got about five thousand. Wow. Uh, in our area, and out of those five thousand, less than five hundred are considered food. The other four thousand and something are either too small, too woody, too nasty tasting or smell like something that we wouldn't want to put in our mouth. Or poisonous. Or poisonous. Yeah, that too. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, caller. And uh, that's, that looks like it. Do we have another call on line two? We'll try. Nope. Okay. Good. Well, and a half. thank you very much, folks. Um, we've enjoyed uh, our little presentation tonight. I hope that you're all able to uh, find some time to come on down this weekend to the Teller Wildlife Refuge. Um, maybe check out the Alliance for the Wild Rockies uh, rendezvous program and uh, if you'd like attend this free workshop on uh, oyster mushrooms. Now, um, should we mention where that is exactly, the Teller Wildlife the, Refuge? Sure. Five miles north of Hamilton, I, is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Five miles north of Hamilton. Um, I guess I'm not You'll, okay, you'll see. You'll see the signs from Highway 93. They'll direct you off to the. Coming from Missoula, they'll direct you off to the left. Great. Mm -hmm. Hope to see you.